All right. Uh, so, Professor Dugan, uh, thank you for, for coming on. Um, I want to talk about pneumachia because I'm investigating pneumachia, uh, and I think it's uh, pr pretty spectacular. So I want to get to that, but first I want to start out with a few like basic questions that a lot of people are curious about. One of them is that um, I have this wonder about uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There's Kiev, and isn't Kiev kind of like a like a, it's almost like a, a holy city, like a Jerusalem to, to Russia. Isn't it important for uh, Russia? The question is, what, would Russia have invaded Ukraine regardless of NATO incursions? Or was that the, the primary spark? Because I would think that um, you describe in your book, The Last War of the World Island, that um, Ki Kiev and Rus sort of starts and then expands with concentric circles and just keeps going and going and going. So anyhow, what are your thoughts on that? On that? So first of all, I don't think that's uh, a special, uh, special military operation that is going on now in these days. Uh, we, could, we cannot uh, easily connect to Naumachia, I would say. So th th there are different levels. So if we start about Kyiv and the importance of this city for Russian consciousness, for Russian history, I would uh, reply that um, uh, the, uh, to, to understand that, we, we should go a little bit deeper in Russian history. Because Russia uh, started from the territory of the central Ukraine, something like that. So that was the beginning of our historical presence of the Eastern Slavs. And uh, after this unity of Kyiv, uh, Kyiv, uh, Rus, uh, Russia of Kyiv, uh, that was uh, creation historically of three branches of the same Eastern Slav people, the people populated this uh, state uh, of Kyiv with the capital uh, in Kyiv. Uh, before before uh, formation of this state, historical state, uh, there were different tribes, Eastern, uh, Eastern uh, Slav uh, tribes, but they were not called Russian. Uh, Russians, we are Russians because of the ruling dynasty, ruling dynasty of uh, German uh, origin. And they called this, this German tribe co was called Russians. And all Eastern tribes uh, controlled and conquered by these German tribes a tribe uh, of ruling dynasty of Rurik were called after that Russians, more or less as French, because French it is Frank, a Frank that was then uh, and Frank was the name of tribe of German people who conquered the Celts, uh, Roman speaking Celts. That more or less, but uh, in um, in uh, and in the Fra in, in France in France as well the roman language continued to be the main language and the ruling elite and dynasty was the german in from from the beginning the uh, the hearts of uh, charlemagne the same for russian rurik dynasty so uh, uh, rurik uh, rurik state the state of rurik uh, who had uh, had different capital in the Novgorod, and after that, after his death, uh, uh, the, the the capital became Kiev. After that, after uh, and that was formation of the Russians, because before that they were called by different tribes' name, Eastern Slavs, and uh, Eastern Slav language became the um, uh, koine, the general, uh, general common language. After that, historically, uh, the part of this uh, population 
has founded a colony uh, called Greater Russia, as Greeks have created uh, Greater, greater um, Greece, um, uh, Grecia Magda in Italy. And Great Russia, it was the colony, Eastern colony of this state. But historically, uh, uh, there was a fight between uh, Western Eastern Slavs in Galich and Volin and Eastern Eastern Slavs, oh, oh, the, the, the followers of this first colonizers of the Eastern part of the Russia, of Great mm -hmm. Russia. And in the time of Andrei Bogolubsky, uh, the, the, the final victory in this struggle over Kyiv, because Kyiv was capital, and who controlled Kyiv was considered to be Grand Duke of Russia. And there uh, was hostility between Western and Eastern representative of the same, of the same uh, uh, Russian people. And after Andrei Bogolubsky, who was the uh, Duke of uh, Vladimir of the Eastern Russia, uh, and then, uh, then afterwards uh, um, around Vladimir was founded Moscow. So after uh, this uh, great Russian victory, the capital was, uh, uh, was uh, transferred into Vladimir. And after that, the, the meaning, historical meaning of Kyiv was lost for our history. So Kyiv became, that was before, before uh, Golden Horde, before Tartarians. That was before, uh, it was in the, uh, in the 13th century, in the beginning of the 13th century, in the end of the 12th century, very, very long ago. So after that moment, after the final, the final, uh, trans, uh, trans, uh, transferring of the capital to the great Russia, the Kyiv has lost its importance. And after that, so almost thousand years, he didn't represent anything for uh, Russian history. Afterwards, during Golden Horde, uh, three branches uh, separated from the main Russian people of, that existed before Golden, before Mongols. Uh, one uh, southern uh, western branch that is called more or less, more or less as Ukrainians. Belarusian that was uh, western, uh, nor northern uh, branch and great, uh, greater Russia that is called uh, that we that now we are calling normally Russian, the meaning greater uh, Russian, great Russian, Velikarose. And the destiny of these three branches uh, was very different because Russia, after the end of the Golden Court, established itself as the new empire. But the, uh, uh, the great Russia was considered by, by everybody in, the, in Russian people as the capital, the, the place where great Grand Duke of Russia was. So it was not just our, our pretension. That was more or less common knowledge during all our history. And Ukrainians and Belarusians Belarusians were in the uh, northern uh, western part, the other branch. They were embedded in different political state of greater, great Lituan, Lituanian, Lithuanian, Lithuanian, Lithuanian state that joined Poland. So they were, they were, they were somehow um, embedded in the in the Polish state with the Catholic dynasty with totally different identity and totally different ruling class, with Catholicism ruling over the uh, Eastern Slav Russians, initially Russians, Orthodox population. And they were marginalized inside of Polish state. And uh, on the contrary, 
Eastern Russians, Greater Russia, they, uh, they uh, uh, always were capital of whole Russia, well, because that was the capital of the place where Grand Duke ha had its throne. After the end of the Golden Horde, uh, and after the fall of the uh, Byzantine uh, Byzantine Empire, Moscow, as continue, con uh, as heir of Vladimir, and as a place where the throne of the Grand Duke was established for many, many hundred years to this moment, to the uh, 15th century. After that, Russia became a greater Russia, Moscovit Russia became, uh, uh, be uh, began to expand and uh, restore step by step uh, ancient territory in the West, peopled by as well Eastern Slavs, but who were for many, many hundreds of years already already citizens of different uh, state of Polish state, and uh, the other part were controlled by Turkey, and the part eastern part of modern days Ukraine was totally liberated from Turks, not from Ukrainians, uh, neither from Polish, but from Turks by Greater Russia and peopled by Greater Russia and peopled as well by some Ukrainian population and Cossacks living near. So that was the, the politics because all this territory belonged to Turk. So the half of Ukraine was the part of Greater Russia after uh, Peter the Great uh, time and, and after- Is this uh, the, the Eastern half of Ukraine we're talking about? Like from the Dnieper? To the, yes, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, eastern part from Dnieper and uh, Dnieper to the east and uh, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, near to Black Sea, the western, uh, southern western part was as well the, uh, the part uh, taken from the Turks and never peopled by, by western part of Russian historic population. So that was creation of the uh, 16th and 7th uh, imperial history of Moscovite. And step by step, Moscovite Tsars, already Tsars, not uh, just Grand Duke after the fall of Ukraine, the, the famous doctrine of Third Rome, started to acquire as well the other part, a Western part of Ukraine as well. And because they, they there uh, didn't exist any political entity. There lived uh, Russian po uh, population, Eastern Slav population under the power of the Polish uh, and before Lithuanian, Lithuanian dynasty and aristocracy with Catholic dominant identity, but the majority of the population kept the Orthodox faith. So that was the liberation, practically liberation. And Kiev didn't, mean anything during all this century. Historical remembers, not uh, some, some uh, sacred, sacred uh, point as Jerusalem, Jerusalem that, that, uh, or Aachen for German, for example, kings. Right. Yeah. So that was very long and totally forgotten history. And Ukraine wasn't, uh, wasn't state there wasn't nation, uh, wasn't uh, uh, people. That was just the outskirt of, of the Russian uh, Western Slavic population uh, who lived under Poland. And the last part, Volin and Galicia, were liberated uh, during Second World War already and annexed to the Russian Soviet Union territory by Stalin. So the, the state, Ukraine, never existed. That was the name of, for example, just outskirt. The, the meaning of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine in Russia, it's outskirt. It, that was Western outskirt 
of empire methodically liberated during the last centuries from Poland, from uh, um, uh, Austria as well, partly, partly the, the other part, and from uh, initially from Turks. So that was a, 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 a re reconquering process of the part of the Russian population that conserved the liberty that have acquired uh, imperial uh, dimension and uh, obtained anew these ter territories in different in different uh, moment of our history. So that it, that was not a Bolshevik creation. That was that was pre-existing state that that had. Has entered in uh, Russian Empire, Russian state, or Soviet state, and after uh, wanted to get out. Ukraine never existed, and uh, uh, the, the Rus of Kiev, more or less coinciding by the space with Ukraine, was split, was totally transformed. And the uh, destiny of three three branches of the uh, original people uh, there uh, was very uh, this this destiny was very different. So more or less in short term, like uh, history of Russia. So um, I coined this term boundary act to refer to uh, one social formation drawing a boundary against another, such as the Greeks against the Persians or Charles Martel against the uh, preventing Islam from crossing the Pyrenees or the Maccabean revolt, that's another boundary act. W would you think of this as a boundary act? Is this a boundary act against the West here that Russia is drawing? So the Western boundary always changed during our history. So uh, first of all, what, what is important that before uh, Mongolian invasion, there uh, was the difference and separation from the subject, who is Russian, who is Russian. And a Russian population wa uh, was um, under other uh, rule, under dynasty of other, of Catholic identity, was Ukraine and Belarus. Mm -hmm. And the independence and a grand, grand duke of Russia uh, um, coincided from some moment with Greater Russia, and when Greater Russia or Moscow with Russia started to affirm affirm itself as the state, in the beginning that was lesser than Poland with Lithuania. So that was one regional regional state, national state, not empire. That uh, we we considered ourselves the heir of Byzantine Empire, but we were more or less small regional part of Eastern Slavs uh, having some independent, independent state. And step by step, after the decline of the Golden Heart, we, uh, we started to reacquire Tartarian uh, Empire. So uh, the part of Golden Heart. And we became the heirs of Golden Heart with its, its more or less boundaries. And during uh, entering in the, this heritage, we as well, we fought with the West, with Catholic Europe, Catholic Europe, and the boundaries between us and uh, Catholic Europe always, always shifted, always moved to the, to the West. And moving this boundary to the West, we liberated original population uh, of Ukrainians and uh, uh, Belarusian, or we peopled some territories, great territories, uh, liberated from Turks, from Ottoman Empire, and we put under control the other people of uh, Caucasian origin, of uh, uh, Central Asia. But th this expansion, it is not, uh, it is not the heritage of uh, uh, Byzantine Empire in geography, in ideology, in the uh, faith and religion, yes. But in the uh, uh, geography, it is pure and direct continuation of Golden Horde. 
of the one of the four four major uh, major part of empire of Genghis Khan. When you were um, so, I was watching your video lectures that you gave in uh, Belgrade uh, that are on YouTube, and I, I finished the first two, but I still have the other eight uh, to go through. But this um, in the second lecture, you were mentioning how uh, you were studying the North American logos and you detested it. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> but well, you understood it through studying it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, the, what the North American logos is, how, how you perceive it? So that, that is totally different topic. So, so oh, yeah. Learned, <laughs> but you do uh, have this concept of different logoi. Right. Okay. So, it, it is yeah. completely different. Uh, so we have uh, explained more or less the situation with uh, the status of Kiev today in the modern days special military operation, and th th that is nothing. That has nothing really serious and important and sacred, and it is just just continuation of the same strategy to move our boundary to the west and liberating the spaces occupied by the Western civilization. So po point here. So it is a boundary point. act, in other words. It, it is a boundary act against the NATO's incursion. Uh, uh, exactly. That boundary. is the boundary, the moving bound boundary of the mm -hmm. Russian civilization to the West, as we always did. We did that for centuries, the same, repeating the same pattern. So, uh, we stop here about this uh, this topic about uh, uh, Western uh, uh, about logos about uh, that is Noamachia. So we yep. are co coming to Noamachia. Now, Mahia, well, I said we'd get to it. <laughs> it's, you know, I just wanted to because a lot of people are going to be curious about the war in Ukraine, obviously, and so. Uh, okay. But now, okay. Numachia. So yeah, okay. I want to talk about Numachia. Which is 24 yes. volumes, right? Now? Yes, 24 volumes. And mm -hmm. one of them, uh, one of these volumes is dedicated to North American logos. But in order to, to uh, speak about that, uh, when I have, um, I, have, uh, um, I have started to, to uh, write this volume dedicated to North America, I uh, thought that that will be a kind of totally, totally hostile uh, cultural code, but that contradicts to my understanding of how Naumachia should be made, because you should not judge the other by your own position. And I have abandoned this preconceived idea about American logos and started to study American logos as if I would be American myself without any prejudice. I have, uh, I have put aside my Russian identity, my Turanian origins, my Orthodox, uh, Orthodox faith, and I, uh, I, uh, I, um, I have uh, di uh, uh, diving, uh, I have a kind of diving into American history, American culture, American American logos, and I, uh, only in that in that way, in full empathy, you can get the interesting results. So that is, uh, so I never, I could not uh, write any line in my book detesting someone, rejecting someone. It is not Namahe. Noamachia is about totally in total involvement in the culture you study. If you have some, some distance, better not, not come to Noamachia. It is not Noamachia. So in, in that sense, um, being um, uh, coming to American Logos, I felt myself as American. Uh, I felt myself as absolutely in love with American identity, identifying with this identity. I find that hard to believe, Professor Dugan. <laughs> in love you with the American you identity. <laughs> you, you, you didn't. You didn't read uh, my my work. No, no, so, no. It's nothing against you. It's just, right? So, uh, f f I, and uh, I could I could share my result. 
So I, I, I came to result that American logos is very much different from the European in many essential features. It is not just colonial continuation of the Anglo-Saxon British uh, society uh, mixed with some other European, European nations, not at all. It is completely original creation. So that is that was my 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 result. So and uh, when I came when I finished uh, Naumachia this volume, I came to myself once again. So it doesn't mean that I love America all the time, but working <laughs> on this volume, I totally I have totally betrayed my own identity in order to get inside American identity. And uh, the same I did with all, uh, all civilizations I have studied. So I didn't project my Russian, Turanian, Eurasianist, uh, uh, Orthodox, uh, uh, traditionalist understanding on the civilizations I've studied, but I I, uh, I, I got directly to this civilization and trying to, 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 to melt down in them, to, to be totally involved, to, 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 be, uh, to be transformed in that. And I, uh, coming out from this experience that uh, was wonderful, uh, to say the truth, and uh, 24 volumes, I, I, I have visited all the civilization existing and uh, ancient. So that was a kind of continuation of Toynbee or Spengler yeah, experience, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. but, but um, basing much more on Franz Boas, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss strategy. So to not to judge from outside, to be totally in total empathy, to being, uh, to go in inside to study for, and to regard not what we see, but what the people from such or such civilization sees. How uh, that is anthropological Franz Boas school approach, American American uh, mm -hmm. anthropology that I I uh, really appreciate. It is not American logos, but it is. Uh, but that is uh, what I uh, I think is absolutely right. You shouldn't study tribe, culture, civilization from outside projecting your own prejudices. That is that the West that always does exactly opposite, opposite that uh, Franz Boas and uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss taught the West to do. It, it is totally- <laughs> I like uh, uh, the French philosopher Alain Badiou's line, uh, we'll respect your differences, the more like us you are. You know, <laughs> that is the kind of the Western mentality. You have yes, to be yes. like us if you yeah. want us to give you loans from the World Bank and the IMF and so forth. What I'm wondering though, uh, that we should talk about the title, New Machia. It evokes like the Greek Gigantomachy, uh, the Titanomachy. Yeah. So Machia yeah. is, is a war and this is the war within the mind, Noose. Could, could you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, that is about the name of the project. So, uh, and, um, if we if we if we describe uh, the the essence of, of the project, it is description of different civilizations, uh, totally in, in full in full conformity with the mentality of them. So studying civilization, it is studied a mentality, and mentality are different. Uh, mentalities are different. Civilizations are different. So studying mentality you could study civilization. And in order to do that, you should abandon all kinds of prejudices about progress, technology, good, bad, value, and all this, all this uh, uh, Western racist, modernist uh, approaches in order to, 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 to make diving uh, in, into the ocean of, of, of the mentality of each civilization. Uh, so studying civilization in my uh, approach is to study mentality of the civilization. And, and the nucleus, nucleus, the, the core of the mentality, we could call nous, nous, Greek word intellect. So studying mentality, studying intellect. So we should 
uh, we should first of all identify um, the, the, the structure of intellect. But, and here I am uh, 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 um, declining and from, uh, I'm get out of the Platonist uh, vision because I think that there is not only one intellect, only one mentality, but there are many mentalities, many basic intellects, and they could not be reduced to the same common pattern. So in order to study civilizations with S, we need to study mentalities with S at the end mm -hmm. and recognize the different kinds of news of intellects inside of that. So we have our own uh, news, uh, Greek, European, classical, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Latin, European, and so on. But that is only one among the other. Indian news, Islamic news, Semitic, African news, Indian news, uh, Ameri uh, American tribes uh, 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 before Colombian, pre-Columbian news. They were different structures of mentality that we shouldn't and couldn't reduce to ours. So, because in, uh, otherwise that will be just racist uh, out, uh, out a monologue of ourselves and the other and so on. That is uh, of no interest for myself. So I recognize, I recognize many news. So news is plural in my opinion. So mentality cannot be um, measured by some norm. So there is no normal mentality. So all mentalities are culturally defined and, and we could not compare them we, we, or, or better we could not uh, hierarchize them we could compare but without hierarchy and without, without saying oh uh, the fate of one mentality is the universal for the other mentalities no uh, one civilization is example to follow for other uh, uh, all other civilization. There is nothing like that. So we need to accept all kind of, uh, of mentalities as they are. And, uh, but next, uh, next step, how to study uh, these differences, how to, to find some common denominator for such variety of the uh, mentalities civilizations. And I have suggested, following Nietzsche, uh, I have suggested to, 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 um, to, to identify Apollinian and Dionysian principles. I started with that. So, but trying to define better and more scientific, more philosophically correct way what is Dionysian logos, I have discovered one uh, forgotten or unknown logos, the logos of Cybele, the logos of great mother. Is that, that the influence on you? I'm sorry for interrupting. Is that the influence of Bakofen? You mentioned Bakofen. Yes, yes. Mother right. And, and many others. So Bakofen, one of the, uh, of, of the many other. But when, uh, when I started to, to, to define the logos of Dionysus, uh, Dionysus. I have remarked that there are many, many cultural, intellectual, philosophical concepts that could not fit in that. And before, earlier, they were, uh, were more or less embedded in the logos of uh, Dionysus. But that was methodological uh, um, error in some in some way, and I have proposed to study the general structure of intellect as having three main global universal form: the logos of Apollo, the logos of Dionysus, uh, uh, and the logos of Sibylle, great mother. And with the introduction of this third logos, I. Uh, have made hypothesis that we could reduce all the me mentalities and all existing civilizations to some proportion and dynamic dialectical interaction 
of these three logos. And that is not given once for all, it is dynamic process. So in all the culture, we could identify all three logos, all three form of nous, and they are in opposition. They could make a kind of alliances. They could create a, a kind of uh, pairs. They could fight against each other, having some uh, some installing peace or uh, reactivating their hostility. This logos, this three logos. So they're sort of like this is the the machia. They're, these three logoi exactly. are at war exactly. with each other in these different civilizations. Exactly, exactly. So uh, it is not the the uh, war between civilization. It is the the uh, the uh, war inside of each civilization we could say for 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 more or less so there are Opoli, uh, olympic uh, olympic principle of the uh, gods of the of the heaven of the patriarchal patriarchate patriarchy uh, the kind of vertical organization of everything the space poli politics values and so on and there is opposite matriarchal uh, purely purely earthly uh, organization coming from from beneath from from the bottom uh, and between them there is a kind of war as in titanomachia or gigantomachia of greek more or less the same so there are two world visions but between there is the third third level of dionysus uh, Dionysus shares partly structure of patriarchy and of matriarchy. It is a kind of in the middle, uh, but it represents the, the special structure of intellects, and we could easily develop, starting from logos of Dionysus, totally and completed culture. And but that will be only one logos, uh, one logos uh, from three logos. And these three logos on the vertical uh, line, they are in the, in the struggle. That is no machia. But when we, uh, and the balance of them is changing. So it is not given uh, once for all. So for example, there is no uh, Apollinean, Dionysian uh, or Sibelian culture. There are elements in any culture of all of these three logos fighting against each other, uh, combining, making peace uh, and truce uh, in, their, in their struggle. So, and that creates unique pattern for all civilizations. And when we concentrate on this internal dynamic of civilization, we get the conclusion that two civilizations cannot understand absolutely any other civilization because everybody is engaged in inner inner nomachia. not it is not uh, for example the west against the east because they have no common measure and the balance of each civilization is very special and belongs to these to only to this civilization the other civilization having the other balance of of this uh, of these three logos could not absolutely understand the other civilization. So it is a kind of uh, solipsistic, the, the worlds, the worlds, not only the path. Uh, these civilizations are not the path of one human world. The human world doesn't exist, or, or it exists as three logos in, in general, as no machia in its, its general principle. But when we come to civilization, any civilization, modern, ancient, eastern, western, great, small, to when we come to civilization, we, we discover new world with all the access, with all the, all, the, all the meanings, all semantics, or all epistemologies totally different, and we could understand them only uh, considering and studying they, its own, uh, belonging to this civilization, balance or proportion between these uh, logos. Right, and, this, and, and speaking in terms of balance, you, you characterize China as logos with the Tao, and the yin yang as kind of a 
uh, a balance or strife between the Apollinean and the Sibelian, right? Uh, China, Chinese civilization is unique because it is Dionysia. In, in, and so the balance is more important there uh, than uh, anything else. But this unique Dionysian balance is created on the opposition of the uh, nomad Turanian, uh, Turanian impulse from the north and Sibelian uh, Austro-Asiatic uh, uh, elements of the southern of the southern China. So Han China, Chinese logos as Han culture, Han culture is Dionysian, but there is always um, on the, in the north Apollinian elements represented by Turanian tribes, Mongolian, Turks, Huns, and and many other Manjurian, and there is. Uh, almost unknown for the world, southern uh, culture of uh, Tibeto-Birman uh, groups and other ethnic minorities, but very, very large minority, huge minorities uh, with some very, very uh, emphasized uh, uh, matriarchal features. So, but the, uh, what we know as Chinese culture, so in Yang, Confucianism, Taoism, everything, Buddhism, Chin uh, Chinese Buddhism, that is Di Dionysian, that because it is based on the balance and nothing is prevailing, neither, neither father nor mother, neither heaven nor earth. They are, uh, they are put in the balance, in dynamic dance, a kind of dance, a kind of uh, uh, circle going by circles and uh, uh, but for example um, we could not say that uh, Chinese culture is only Dionysian it as well is it, it has Chinese identity has the other logos as well represented by these uh, clearly defined clearly, clearly seen element of Turanian nomads culture um, uh, finishing with uh, ending with Chinggis Khan uh, and with uh, uh, Yuan, Yuan dynasty of Mongolian uh, dynasty or Manjurian dynasty that, that uh, ruled until the end of the Chinese empire and lesser, no, lesser known uh, southern, southern uh, Chinese culture uh, with different, different, di different ethnic groups, Lao, Mao, and, and other. So China uh, is example of how Dionys uh, Dionysian logos could prevail. And it seems sometimes that it is unique, unique, that there's only one logos, the, the yellow Dionysus. But at the same time, there are as well the other, uh, other uh, other logos inside of Chinese culture. Uh, it's interesting how uh, you characterize like Plato and Aristotle as Apollonian, but it surprised me when you characterized Heidegger as Dionysian. Um, yes, can you elaborate yeah. on that a bit? Uh, uh, not only uh, uh, Apollonian logos is pure Platonism, pure in, 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 in the European terms, in European tradition, it is uh, Plato. Plato with its transcendental relation between uh, the um, ideas and the things. Ideas belong, they are eternal, they belong to heaven, they, they have uh, ontological and metaphysical predominance over the things, and that creates purely the pure, pure in the European patriarchal version of the Logos. It is pure Apollo. And I have found in many, many texts of, uh, of, of Plato's dialogues and Neoplatonic tradition, uh, direct confirmation of the link between Socrates and Plato and the symbolism of Apollo and uh, uh, their, their uh, adherence uh, to, the, um, to the priesthood of Apollo in, in, in general sense. So that is, that is pure Apollinian. But Aristotle is, is totally different. I consider Aristotle to be Dionysian because he- Now that's a surprise. <laughs> that surprises yeah, me. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. 
Yes, yes, and th that Arist Ar Aristotle for, for me is Dionysian and Heidegger, and Heidegger is anti-Platonic as Aristotle was anti-Platonic because Aristotle and Heidegger, they start, start with immanence, with something that is here. So for Aristotle- The entelechy is put inside the inside, biological- Inside, absolutely. Yeah. There is, uh, according to Aristotle, the thing uh, could, uh, could exist when it has matter and form. The for pure form doesn't exist for Aristotle. And for Plato, idea could exist easily without any matter. So for Aristotle and for existentially, uh, I, I see the great resemblance between phenomenology starting from uh, Brentano, Husserl and Heidegger and Aristotle. So that is the same Dionysian way of thinking of immanence, but this immanence isn't material, materialist, because materialism is third logos. And when we introduce the logos of Sibylle, we understand this difference that Heidegger uh, and Brentano and Husserl uh, and Aristotle, they were anti-Plato because they, they deny uh, transcendence and uh, predominance of pure idea over the thing. They, they are dealing with the thing, but they are dealing with the thing as such immanence without ma 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 materialism. So they don't, don't reduce the things to the matter. The matter for them and the spirit for them are a kind of a posteriori. They, they follow the thing. So they are de de devoted to the thing, to the world, to, to design, to be here and to be, uh, to be T slash here, to be there. And uh, as uh, some time uh, in English, they try to, to, uh, to translate the term design. Design to be not, uh, not here, neither here nor there, to be in between T slash here. So to be in between, because da it is not here, not uh, neither dort in, in German. Dasein it to be in between, between here and there. So uh, that Dasein it is precisely not transcendent, not ma ma matter, ma materialist. So Dasein is in the middle, in between, and that is precisely the huge ontology of intermediary. Uh, level of, of being that is existential, not essential, existential, uh, and it is intermediary. And that is why I uh, call that the logos of Dionysus uh, um, uh, speaking or, or reading better, reading Aristotle and Heidegger and phenomenology or structuralism, structuralism. But with introduction of the third logos, of materialism, atomism, purely idea that the, all the things uh, 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 go uh, from uh, matter, or uh, uh, and that nothing of the sort we find in Heidegger and Heidegger. Matter, so. mother, uh, th these are interrelated terms, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand the civilian logos better, because it, it, uh, it has to do with matter, right? But is it also horizontal? Because it denies the vertical, the Apollinean verticality. Um, it it is a kind of uh, horizontal, but uh, external. So there is internal horizontality and external horizontality. So when you have Aristotle, Aristotelian or Heideggerian ontology, you have a hidden center, uh, inner internal center, selbst of design uh, in Heidegger. Uh, ac a a active intellect, uh, nous poeticos, uh, in Aristotle. So something that is in the in the in the center of the horizon of the circle, and uh, the balance relation between the thing that is on the periphery and the center that is pure intellect is precisely the huge space of the philosophy, philosophical space that is Dionysian space, the dialectical space between inner and. Uh, outer 
and the matter is in outside of of, of the thing it is in the exter externality it is uh, beyond the thing in a kind of external transcendence as a newton so there is some a materialist a materialist metaphysic mm. uh, that try to explain a kind of uh, reverted Platonism on inverted inverted Plat uh, Platonism that say, oh, everything is mat uh, material. Everything uh, comes from from uh, from uh, beneath, from from the some uh, bottom bottom of the of the reality that lies. Everything the the, the being is lying on the outer outer side of, of, of the thing and that is not nothing as for aristotle and for plato but is something that is being pro properly so this uh, apophatic unknown hidden being uh, in externality explains in logos of uh, sibylle everything so that is maternal point of view and that was represented as Bachofen has uh, shown in the pre-Greek, pre-Indo-European uh, Mediterranean culture with many, many interesting symbolic arrests uh, and something remains in, uh, in culture. But I think that this pre-patriarchal, uh, pre pre-patriarchal uh, pre uh, um, uh, structure, we was once more once more discovered with the Western modernity and Western materialism, nominalism, that is revival of this uh, pre-Indo-European, uh, uh, pre-Apollonian uh, and Dionysian uh, philosophy. Uh, that is continuation of atomism, of Epicureanism, of Lucrezi, Lucretius, Lucretius Carr. So that existed as well from the, from the antiquity and uh, in modernity is a kind of revival, a great revenge of the Cybele or Titanomachia, the new element, new episode in Titanomachia, Gigantomachia, when Titans have, have won over gods. They have, they have conquered Olympus and they have established their materialistic, progressist, Sibelian, matriarchal, atomistic, uh, epistemology. So, uh, th but that is just episode in Western history. It is not destiny. It is just uh, just one of the of the moment of Western nomachia, not uh, universal, but very very dangerous. But nevertheless, that is, that is inscribed in the dialectic. Uh, Spengler mentions in uh, the decline of the West, where he talks about the Ur symbols of the different civilizations. He talks about the Russian Ur symbol as this flat horizontal plane, which does seem to resonate. Uh, does the Sibelian logos resonate with that idea? That's what I thought of when I heard you on the lecture first describing it. That oh, here's the Russian Ur symbol, the the infinite plane that denies verticality. Um, I recently found a, a Russian modernist architect. It really surprised me. Uh, I was watching a history of of Russia videos. Uh, Lizitsky, and, and he designs these horizontal skyscrapers. Uh, they were never built, apparently, but I was, I was like, there it is. <laughs> Spengler was right. It was it's the Russian Ur symbol. But how do you feel about that? About Spengler characterizing the Russian Ur symbol as the infinite flat plane? So um, it is interesting. I have dedicated three volumes to Russian logos, and uh, for the and that, that is as well not not easy to. To, to identify. First of all, our state always had its own logos, and that was Apollonian. That was exactly as in Western Europe. So our Tsars, our, uh, our Dukes, our aristocracy was exactly the same as in the Byzantine Empire, in the Roman Empire, in um, German dominated aristocracy of the Western Europe. So the logos of our, of our state was Apollonian and was vertical and Platonic and Christian and Orthodox Christianity as well is Apollonian. But the logos of our peasantry 
of, of that uh, represented the absolute majority of our population during all our history until uh, uh, until um, uh, years uh, 30 of 20th century before 30 that was uh, 99 percent of population living as peasants uh, so Russians normally were peasants and there uh in, on the on the level of the people dominated precisely dionysian logos dionysian expanding horizontally but not in in the materialistic materialistic way but with materialism coming from the western western modernity uh our, our elite not people have has uh, have this our elite have this has discovered uh, and has imitated the logos of Sibylle, materialistic science with Peter the Great, and uh, the state from Apollinian came to Sibylian. And that was, the, so our people have has received materialism, this deeper dimension from above, not from, uh, from below. That is very, in, uh, very particular. And Soviet period, was culmination of this Sibylian uh, attitude to, to, to the reality. That was precisely Sibylian uh, uh, century. Uh, but uh, Russian people never, never identified totally uh, itself, neither with, uh, with uh, state, uh, that was something transcendental, very respected, uh, but not, not the same. That was interesting. Ru Russian people is very anarchistic in some way. So we respect and more we respect the order, not because we are ordered, but because we are, not, we are totally chaotic, chaotic. So we, we love order because without the order, we could not, uh, we could not uh, uh, save the world. Our chaotic, uh, nature of Russian, we are so free, so indiv so individualistic, so chaotic that we could destroy the world. So, in order to put us in in the norm, we need very hard state. It's quite different from Germans, for example. Any German uh, has uh, the order inside in his soul. We have no no order in Russian soul. That's why we need. Uh, very, very, very hard, strong state with strong leader, with a great father. Uh, without that, we we, we will be, uh, we would destroy the, the humanity and ourselves. So that is very dialectical. Everything in our history, as well uh, now, expansion. Uh, this expansion on the horizon of Russia, or, or, or it is not. Um, con uh, uh, conquer, uh, conquering uh, impulse, not to obtain. It is just to live. It is uh, just continuation of our living space, Leban, Leban's realm, not the uh, space to live, but living space, the, the space with its own soul, animated space, the, the, the space that lives through us. So not we are living in the space, it's something totally external. Ex space existential space, space right, right? This is what exactly. you call existential space. Yeah. Existential space. And that is why I identify design, design and, uh, uh, and the civilization. Uh, uh, you, in, your, in your speech, you have spoken very interesting thing about different understanding of design in Heidegger and in Spengler. Uh, and uh, Spengler, as you have uh, uh, pointed out, Spengler stressed this, uh, this um, uh, sp uh, space element, space aspect of, of design, mineral, almost mineral, crystallic, crystalline, crystallic uh, 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 element of design. And Heidegger uh, meant something completely different. In my, my vision, design is precisely living space. So it's this existential space. And for Russians, for us, it is, uh, it is quite normal, quite natural to see the space as not material, but living space. So uh, th that is a kind of, we don't make a real separation 
between the space itself in its objective materialist uh, existence and uh, our living in that space. So this thing are uh, totally totally merged uh, uh, b- uh, between them. They they are they are combined. They we could not separate the space from existential space. That is why for us, that is why for us design uh it is a kind of integral integral concept for heidegger on one hand and uh, for spenger on the other hand would you say that then the in terms of these three logoi that the sibelian impulse predominates right now in the west whereas the dionysian impulse predominates more in russia uh i i think the things are a little bit complicated uh western modernity it is ongoing process of the growth of the Sibelian elements, but we could not reduce to Sibelian logos all, including modern history of the West, because there are so many Apollinian elements, so many Dionysian cultures was uh, when when in the West there was still culture, it was mostly Dionysian in, in the modernity. For example, uh, Black Romanticism, Rembo, Mallarmé, they were clearly Dionysian, not, not Sibelian. So Sibelian, it is the last stage, it's pure de- decadence. But generally, the logos of Sibeli uh, um, uh, was, uh, was growing all, all, all last century, more and more and more and more, but uh, Apollinian elements uh, in philosophy, Dionysian elema- elements in culture were as well present. So we could not uh, simplify uh, um, uh, uh, the situation of the Western modernity to, to, to reduce it only to Sibelian. It is clear that Sibelian uh, tendency, materialistic tendency, a living matter of Bergson, this uh, materialism of liberalism, materialism of communism, materialism of nationalism, every kind of materialism is here and where there is something materialist, uh, there is uh, science. Uh, the Western science is civilian, uh, almost totally externalist, materialist. But uh, we could not uh, uh, reduce all Western modern culture to civilian logos, but uh, civilian logos dominates clearly, uh, certainly. Ra- in Russia, we have the mixture, the confusion, the precisely pseudomorphosis. You have mentioned as well this term of Spengler. Yeah. Uh, pseudomorphosis from Peter the Great, we have. Uh, and we had uh, from uh, this moment uh, confused and combined at the identity where, uh, where uh, materialist civilian logos was taken from the West, from the modern West, and by, by the very hard Apollinian state introduced in the Dionysian uh, Dionysian society that create a, a kind of illness, and we, we are sick uh, because uh, to uh, pseudomorphosis it is sickness, it is illness. Because Un- underneath that pseudomorphosis, do you do you think that Russia, like Spengler says, in, in contrast to the what the atheistic West is fundamentally pious, that it, that it has a fundamentally religious attitude? Right? Yes, yes. Uh, we we could say uh, uh, better to say. Under, uh, under, uh, beneath this uh, pseudomorphosis, a Russian uh, society is very, very traditional, very traditional in any senses, pious, religious, metaphysical, uh, Dionysian as people, Apollonian as state. So, but traditional, we, uh, but uh, pseudomorphosis, um, doesn't give, doesn't let us to express that. So on, on, on the surface, we are modern, we are like uh, European, uh, but beneath this appearance, 
we are very, very, very particular, very Eurasianist, very traditionalist, very mystic. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, Heidegger as well has seen that, that uh, beneath communism, there is something other in Russian history. We could not explain the Russian identity with communism. Communism was the, the other, uh, other element of pseudomorphosis. Yes, Spengler knew that it would fail too. He says, he gave a speech um, in 1922 on the two faces of Russia, where he's talking about the pseudomorphic Russia and the authentic Russia. And he says, communism is obviously not uh, authentic Russian. It, it will fail. So he made that prediction. He, he saw that that, that was going to happen. Um, exactly. And the Eurasianist, the Eurasianist, the Russian Eurasianists uh, affirmed the same. So, so uh, they, they have seen clearly beneath um, this uh, communism, this Marxism, this uh, modernization, industrialization, they, uh, they, uh, they have seen clearly this, the Russian soul that is much more uh, sane and much more traditional than uh, in other, another civilization, in, in Western civilization, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. what no, is I interesting think. that the concept of pseudomorphosis uh, has led me uh, to, 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 to get deeper in the Western uh, society. And I have discovered traditional element uh, or level uh, in Western society as well. Not everything in the West is modern. It is, it is error to, to, to believe in that. So of, officially, yes. So that is the common knowledge or co common, uh, um, common uh, conventional wisdom that everything is modern. But I think the West is as well very pseudomorphosic and very, very, uh, very, very sick as well, because there is the suffering element of the people, the soul of the people of the West who is suffering, who, 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 uh, who doesn't agree with modernization. That so pseudomorphosis of Spengler it, uh, can be applied not only to the obvious cases in Russia, because Russia, in Russia is obvious, it is superficial, we, it is so easy, it is on the surface, but we could, uh, we could apply the same method of pseudomorphosis to, to the West and uh, the people, uh, peoples of the, uh, of the West uh, itself are, are not, could not be uh, uh, identify with the official image of modern, individualist, liberal, socialist, democracy. Yes, on the surface, yes, but inside the people, you could not, you could not kill uh, uh, the, hu uh, the human soul, and the human soul is uh, much uh, richer than only logos of uh, cyberly. So I think that the uh, Western peoples as well, as well, uh, beer in them, these uh, the other logos and Dionysia and Apollinian, so traditional, much more traditional. And in populism, we see that. I think that the people voting for Trump in your country, they, they were moved by this disagreement with the dominant uh, liberal globalist ideology. Uh, and so that was the kind of uh, pseudomorphosis of American society that is totally unknown. So uh, the conventional wisdom affirms that uh, pseudomorphosis it is a colonial society, Russia or China or India or post-colonial states. But we could uh, see as well the process of colonization by modernity of the Western tradition and this tradition, the rest uh, of this tradition, still still exists. That is very, very, uh, very funny, I think, and very interesting. What about this? Uh, so in, um, in the second book, you talk about this concept of geosophy. Uh, would you like to discuss that? I... That is precisely the uh, geosophy. It is a method to study civilizations. So we, uh, when we are uh, in, in first volume introductory, I have two introductory volumes. In first, I have uh, I am explaining what are three logos and uh, how they are structured and to which uh, may, most uh, uh, known uh, religious, philosophical, cultural, political, social, and so on, uh, 
uh, scientific uh, structures they correspond. And uh, second volume is called uh, Geosophy, and that is precisely methodical, the explanation of the method, how this vertical three logos pattern could and should be applied to the concre concrete existential space to concrete civilization. So geosophy, it, uh, uh, idea of multipolar structure of, of, of the human space and invitation to regard any, any civilization as special design, as existential, existential space uh, with uh, vertical of all three logos and uh, dialectical, dialectical manifestation of them during the history. So here we have statical image. So we define, for example, Indian civilization. And in this uh, Indian civilization, we have one, one uh, design, one existential space, and all three logos. And our uh, our our um, challenge in Naumachia in the uh, next volumes uh, was precisely to apply uh, this methodology uh, correctly to study of all civilizations. So we could not say, for example, the Indian logos is Apollinian. It is not true. It is partly th true. Vedic, yes. Uh, the, the Vedas are Apollinian, clearly, absolutely, but there is the huge amount of the uh, of the um, Dravidic uh, logos, totally different, and there are so many other forms inside of Hinduism that you characterize the the, uh, the yoga as Dionysian. Then is, is that no, no, yoga <laughs> is more, more, much more Sibelian. Civilian. Shivaism is Dionysian. So uh, Shiva. the, uh, Shivaism is Dionysian. Okay. Uh, Shiva, Shiva, Dionysian, Dionysian, and yoga. It is interesting. It's more Titanic. It is about prakriti. It is about matter. So that is the kind of some spiritual materialism in yoga. Uh, uh, because there are different branches. Some of them are dominated by Apollinian elements, by transcendental elements, but there's some of them, yoga precisely, uh, is uh, much more materialism, uh, materialistic uh, uh, tradition. So there are many, many um, uh, strange, uh, strange discoveries uh, when we, we get deeper in uh, the civilization, not judging from outside, not following uh, 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 conventional wisdom, uh, not uh, repeating the common places. When we try to study, study um, some civilization without any prejudices at all, we could discover un totally unsuspected elements. For example, uh, I, I, uh, in uh, Indian culture, I followed, uh, I followed uh, Mircea Eliade, yeah. a great writer, and uh, I have discovered in his writing uh, uh, dedicated to India that he was motivated as well by finding by searching for this dualism of Indian tradition. Interesting, it is not on the surface. I, I have read many times in my life uh, Eliade's uh, works uh, and right. only uh, working myself on Noah Mahia, uh, I have, I have uh, with great astonishment, I have discovered that finally he was, his main interest was as well as mine to identify polarity in Indian culture. It is not obvious, it is not, not uh, on the surface, but it is very interesting and the many uh, other things. So uh, uh, it is not, uh, mm, uh, not, uh, not um, uh, banal uh, conclusions of, uh, of Naamakhe. And for example, returning to uh, American logos, uh, uh, I uh, have finally, uh, identified um, North American logos with pragmatism. And pragmatism is something totally different from utilitarianism. It's boring. <laughs> They're both boring. <laughs> uh, it seems to be very stupid, but from outside. <laughs> Uh, it is maybe boring, but I, I, I knew I would get you to smile, Professor Dugan. You never smile when people interview you. And I was like, I'm going to make him smile. I guarantee it. 
<laughs> yes, uh, and uh, uh, pra pra pragmatism, uh, pragmatism. Mm, you know that is uh, total total freedom from a uh, predefinition of the uh, realm of object and subject. And the only thing that really, really uh, is taken in consideration is uh, the process of interaction of two totally undefined uh, domain of the inner domain, external, uh, 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 external domain. So that it works, it works. So pragmatic, uh, it is a kind, maybe it is a little bit Dionysian because uh, no, uh, nobody cares about the subject. You can be uh, everybody, Elton John, uh, um, um, uh, you can be uh, Elvis Presley, uh, that is not that, or uh, those are words. I, those are names I thought I would never hear from your mouth in a million years, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Elton John. Uh, yes, yes, but, uh, but uh, so, so uh, I, 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 I like, I, I, want, I want to say that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the subject, is totally, totally free. So you could pretend to be anybody and nobody could say, oh, you're, oh no, you are not that because nobody care, cares who are you. So that is pure freedom for, for subject and the same for object. Nobody could say, oh, this is scientifically, scientifically proved. If something is scientifically proved, uh, you you are limited to make discoveries. So America is the the, uh, the camp uh, of freedom. So you uh, the world outside are totally free. The world inside is totally free. Everything, uh, every, uh, the unique thing that is important is what is between. But that is precisely pragmatism, and it could give uh, Emerson, it could be give Toro, it could give romanticism. It could give uh, some uh, pra uh, some practical uh, uh, application. It could could be capitalist. It could be scientific. It would be cultural. But main idea that there is no subject and an object. There is no norms, uh, neither uh, in, inside uh, nor outside. Only only things. Uh, that that are working or not working, but not working, not no problem. Something <laughs> work will work instead. So I think I I, I don't think that is boring. I, it is it, it it seems a little bit stupid, not boring, but very engaging. Uh, so for example, it is attractive. So if you are, uh, for example, in in Europe, it is completely inimaginable. So they are known, uh, they know absolutely what is the subject, how your, your rationality functions, uh, what is the object, what is, what, uh, who, what is uh, atomic structure of matter, what is possible, what is not possible, you know, the angels uh, don't exist, and they could f kill you with uh, their skepticism, with their knowledge about inner and outer things. That is about uh, Europe and new, new uh, world. America doesn't care about subject and object, but they're great. I, I, I think that uh, it is completely uh, uh, far from us. So it is. Uh, it is not our uh, uh, our tradition. So that is totally, totally yeah. quite different. But I think I, I find that uh, very sympathetic to say the truth because it is. It is kind of uh, very sympathetic um, obscurantism uh, that, that is attractive. I would say. You. Um, I, I've heard you mention individuals like Stockhausen and Werner Herzog. Uh, both of whom I love, and uh, but I'm wondering what your attitude is to American pop culture. Do you do you like it at all, or is it, or is it something that you just can? Well, so, uh, I, I like Stockhausen as well because I think that uh, Boulez, Stockhausen are very very um, uh, very symbolic for our age. So yeah. the cacophonic music, it is precisely. Uh, but um, I, I, I think that there are some very interesting elements in pop culture. As so, uh, what, what is uh, um, you know, what is important is the it is our our uh, our, uh, our possibility to see to interpret. 
So, um, and in pop culture, there are so many interesting elements in the rock, for example, in the psychedelic music, uh, in the noise scene. In, uh, um, I, I think that uh, um, what uh, that is all about interpretation. I think that cultural, any cultural element could be correctly or incorrectly interpreted. So for that, I think that in many aspects, American music, uh, as for example, American anthropology, uh, 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 argument not in favor of uh, uh, global ideology of liberal uh, globalism, uh, but something totally opposite. So you can find in uh, find in United States in the cultural scene in the, in the art many arguments that we could easily use to criticize precisely this uh, liberal hegemony. Uh, so the, the kind of and uh, now it is uh, lesser than before, but in the 70s and 60s, uh, I like Kerouac, I like Bitnik very much and many other elements. So I think that the ex uh, there are so many existential elements in the American cinema and America rock scene. So an American, uh, an American uh, writer. So I think that is all do, that is worth it. Do, you go, do you go and see movies? Do you go and see movies very often? Today, uh, uh, today we don't come to theater. It's on uh, on the screen and on, on our computer. So uh, I, I normally I normally see some movie movies and uh, not uh, only. For example, I'm fan uh, of uh, B movie. And there what? Are some what was that? I missed it. B movie, B movie, B movies, B movies. Uh, yes, very bad American movies. Yeah, who are so <laughs> bad that uh, you could not um, uh, could, yeah. could not accept that is true. The, the, when you see, for example, some of them, you could not believe your eyes. So yeah. you could not make such 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 a terrible thing. But they exist, and they <laughs> that is a kind of um, a kind yeah. of revelation, I would say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there is trauma studio. Maybe you don't, yeah, I, I presume intellectuals don't know that. Uh, it is for for a. Uh, Totally idiot, uh, American and global idiot, but uh, idiot. Uh, Are you saying idiot? Idiot. Trauma studio. Trauma. Trauma. Ah, uh, no, I don't know. Okay. Trauma. That is that is a, a, a real tra thrash. Real thrash. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. But you like it. You like some of it. You're saying though, right? Is yes. It? So yeah. I I I, uh, I don't. That's a surprise uh, to me. <laughs> There was a kind of uh, um, hippies initiative in the 80s uh, that was called Incredible Strange Culture. I have all, all of the issues of this uh, non-conformist journal, Incredible Strange Cinema. I've heard of it. I've music. heard of it. Yeah. Yes, that, that is uh, of some kind of uh, radical, um, radical idiotic um, um, uh, piece of art or piece of culture, but I think that on, on the limits, the most important things are always on the limits, not, not in, the, uh, uh, in the mass culture. So um, mass culture is, um, is a kind of, um, uh, the, the, the main aspect, uh, everything is hidden in mass culture. Only when mass culture becomes too bad, something some some reasons some some elements or of its structure becomes to be um, uh, we can remark we, we, we could identify do you like slavoj zizek at all you do you know no, not at all no i think not at all <laughs> oh this is great so so why not i, I want to hear. but uh, i think uh, uh, slavoj zizek has one secret if you know lacan uh, so there will be no no more mystery in Zizek. Zizek, it is very correct, very um, I would say authentic and very um, orthodox continuation and application of Lacan's theories. I have studied some some time some years Lacan, and uh, Zizek is a continuation of application of Lacan. 
Zizek understands Lacan very well, so that is for him. But I don't think uh, Lacan is much richer than Zizek. And if we understand Lacan, we we can be a hundred uh, times more interesting than, than Zizek, only no. following Lacan, because Lacan is it is uh, really really attractive for for myself. He is nihilist. He is rather in uh, and a logos of uh, Sibylle, but nevertheless, uh, I like his irony, irony, I would say. Yeah, I, I had basically the same impression of Zizek. I read a bunch of his books. I thought he was funny and, and an entertaining writer, but that there was no original ideas of his own that you That could... is not philosopher. It, that yeah. is not philosopher. That is practical application of Lacanism, correct. So, uh, so what is good because for example, for, for Lacanists, that is something you you understand immediately what uh, what he what he is saying. If you are not Lacanist, you could be um, easily confused. Uh, so you try to to interpret, but you have no keys, and you are uh, impressed, confused, uh, um, seduced sometimes sometimes. But uh, if uh, a reaction is such so uh, th that is only one, only one uh, only one meaning in that uh, incorrect reading of Zizek. It is uh, absence of knowledge of Lacan. With the knowledge of Lacan, everything is quite different. Uh, it is entertaining. It is uh, clear. It, it is correct. And it, th that is boring because you could say uh, anything for him because it is. Clearly, clearly based on Lacanian, Lacanian topology, hermeneutic, yeah. hermeneutic, and his uh, structuralism. I'm curious what your favorite movie of all time is. Do you have one? I, I could not say. No, uh, it is. It, uh, How about a couple I, of them? I like generally. I like uh, early uh, Takeshi Miike cinema, uh, Japanese thrash. Um, so uh, early. Now he he became totally totally uh, exhausted i would say so but i i like many 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 films uh, i like Tarantino, what? for example tarantino you, tarantino you like quentin tarantino yeah. uh, what's your opinion of tarkovsky no i don't like tarkovsky at all you don't like so him? i think it's pretentious it is uh it is a, a kind of uh uh, he is overestimated in my opinion. Uh, I, I don't like too much Soviet or Russian cinema, Soviet Russian. There was very interesting marginal film, uh, The Children of the Gods of Iron, uh, of Tomasz Tot, Hungarian, Hungarian director, but with Russian actors. And, and th that was a Russian movie. Uh, very funny, I think. Ah, okay. No, I haven't seen it or heard of it. Um, it's very marginal. Nobody, all right. nobody um, knows it. How about, so for a final question uh, regarding Russia, do you agree with Spengler's assessment that Russia is entering into its springtime and it's it's on the way up? Uh, I think that uh, I, I agree with Spengler about special destiny of Russia, uh, that uh, Russia is not just a country of, of Europe, uh, it has, uh, Russia has its own age, its own, its own structure, it, its own pattern of history, it is not just uh, uh, the same as West, uh, it is not the part of the West. And that I agree, and Spengler uh, saw that very clearly. But um, I'm not sure that uh, we could uh, measure the ages of civilizations and cultures as we measure the ages of human life or um, of the seasons uh, and so on. I think Russia is approaching very important point in its own history. So um, uh, now Russia is uh, close to fulfillment of very important apocalyptic mission. That was always the secret and uh, almost open sometimes mover of Russian history. So our, our balance uh, of uh, knowledge of news, of our news, the balance of uh, theologos in us, uh, our understanding of 
a Russian understanding of time, of structure of time, all that coincides uh, now, all that co coincides now um, in on the eve, uh, on the edge, uh, on the border of some very important event. Heidegger used the term Ereignis, Ereignis, Ereignis in German, event, event as something that is a kind of change of regime of existence of design, uh, important change, the change uh, in favor of great, uh, great awakening, of, of great return uh, to the, the center, to, to the core. And I think the Russia now uh, is, uh, is preparing to uh, make this leap inside. So that could give the image of the spring of the new, new flourishing period. Ursprung, like an Ursprung. Yeah. Yes, 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 something like that. But it is as well a return to the uh, to the accomplishing of the mission. I would say so. Russia is invested with the mission in front of apocalyptic apocalyptical moment of the history. Uh, not only Russian, but Russia relating to other other uh, civilizations, to Western civilization, civilization above all. So, and in that relation of Russia to herself and to the other, to, to the West, Russia is going to accomplish something very, very important of, of the global importance, I would say. Uh, but it is very, very difficult to describe correctly this event because it's something metaphysical i would say it is not just flourishing or prosper prospering periods or that that is something more more mm, more mysterious i would say so russia is going to accomplish something we don't know what is it so event it is about that does, does putin ever take your advice and and apply it or, or... Because it's very rare for you know like a political figure to take advice from a philosopher and apply it in actuality. I, th I think that's extremely rare. So I was just curious about what your relationship with him is like. Uh, I don't. I don't think that uh, you are right that it is very uh, very uh, rare the case when the polit politicians, modern politicians, uh, hear the. Uh, uh, advise, advises uh, of the philosophers, and I, I don't think that Putin is the exception. But um, Russian uh, Russian history and Russian destiny and Russian mission is not just the product of my brain. So it is something much more ontological. And if I um, give the words. To some, to some realities uh, embedded deep inside of Russian society, Russian history, Russian identity. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, it is just subjective construction. So the same, the same uh, forces, they are, uh, they are, um, uh, uh, they are manifesting. Uh, from um, from the leader, uh, from uh, they are manifesting through through the leader, uh, through Putin, through uh, other figures, through our society, uh, and sometimes against themselves. So uh, Putin personally, uh, as individual, is quite different from the Putin uh, as historical figure. So they are somehow in contradiction in opposition that is why i have written the book the putin against putin putin. versus putin right putin putin. <laughs> exactly. i haven't read it yet i haven't read it yet but i want to so uh the, the idea is that um uh, uh, there are a kind of two putins not personally but uh, as in the in the in the context of ernst uh, kantarovich uh, in, interesting his, his uh, uh, uh historian uh, Ernest Kant Kantarovich, who has written the book Two, Co Two Bodies of the King. So uh, if a normal person has uh, one body, the king has two bodies. And one of the body of the kings is mystical one. So 
this mystical one, uh, mystical Putin, the, uh, the, the transcendental body of Putin is a kind of, of one of his identity, and that identity is linked, deeply linked uh, with events, with Russian mission, with the logic of Russian history, and sometimes Putin gives the sign that he is in the direct connection with this, uh, with this, uh, with this imperial imperial body of of, of Putin and of imperial dimension of Russian of Russian history, apocalyptic and imperial dimension, uh, sacred holy dimension of uh, of our of uh, our destiny. Uh, and uh, I think that, but um, the spirit, spirit uh, uh, walks uh, where it uh, wants. Uh, so the real spirit doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, 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 isn't, isn't, uh, isn't dependent from the uh, normal way of influence. For example, there are so many people around Putin who uh, see him uh, regularly with no influence uh, on him, with zero influence uh, on him. So that is not about quantity, that is about quality, I would say. So uh, our relations uh, are uh, rather on the level of this deep identity uh, than on the surface or just uh, uh, about my advisors. Uh, but you have uh, met with him personally? You, you, I never, I never answered this question. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. Um, okay, Professor Dugan, uh, that was a, a real pleasure. You're definitely my kind of thinker, um, and <laughs> it's very, very rare to find. You're, you're just a gem, a, a total treasure. And I want to go through the rest of Numakia, uh, and it would be nice to converse with you again about uh, the rest of Numakia. Are there plans for an English translation anytime soon? Yes, some somehow some some people uh, tried to start the translation, but um, some uh, but that demands too much uh, uh, efforts. Maybe one by one. I I think that um, it's uh, it would be better uh, to 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 start with the introductory uh, volumes, and after uh, afterwards, uh, um, it is not necessary to translate everything. I think, uh, but uh, one. Uh, or two volumes that, uh, to some special civilization. The books are very, very, very big. It's, it will take some of my friends has counted how many years uh, they need to translate or accomplish this translation. But I think with the help of, of, uh, mm, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, technology of uh, deep L, for example, translation and with uh, after um, some reduction, some proof uh, of people of, with competence. It could be achieved much easier than to in all the way to translate everything uh, by hand. But uh, uh, there are plans, but nothing, nothing concrete uh, about uh, full translation. But so it's, think... it's going to be a while. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yes, it is, it uh, is just a process. I'll just have to wait for it. Um, I wish it was in English. I would read it immediately. Um, okay. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Professor Dugan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we I, can I, talk I, again. I would like to talk more about Numakia as I go through the videos. With that... great pleasure. And I would I would like to, to conclude that I appreciate very much your lecture that I, you have delivered. Oh, thank you. And that is what's really interesting and that really you defended uh, the cause uh, of the multiplicity of civilizations, uh, explaining explaining uh, Spengler's vision was very clear and very 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 uh, very deep uh, deep uh, explanations with clear words. So I appreciate it very well and uh, very much. And uh, I would like to, Thank you. to stay in touch and continue a kind of dialogue. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for Thank those you kind much. words, uh, Professor Dugan. That, that means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we'll okay. see you again. Uh, take care and have a good night. Thank you. You're welcome. You too.